Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's me, Chloe, and today we're going to be doing a read aloud of reading all these. How many books do we have here? We have we have five books, and these are all the same series. These are called Treetop Twins Wilderness Adventures. And these are just tiny little books from McDonald Happy Meals. I just decided to do this video for fun. So we're going to learn about animals here. So which book should I read first? Let's see. Amy, Minnie, Miney, Mo, Catch a Tiger, Buy Its Toe, If He Hollers, Let Him Go, Any, Minnie, Miney, Mo. Okay. I chose this one. So let's see. Let's start reading. I'm going to read all these books in this video. Okay, so like and subscribe. Here we go. These are so tiny. Okay, Treetop Twins, Wilderness Adventures, The Twins Walk with a Wooly Mammoth. Is it called Mammoth or Mammoth? Can I call them? I'm going to say Mammoth. <laughs> the snow gleamed and dazzled as the sun glinted off the ice. The Treetop family have taken their time machine back 20,000 years. To Ice Age North America, the treetop family were on, were on skis. And although the sun was shining, it was still absolutely freezing. So this is the treetop family. So I, doubt, I read these books before, of course. This is their dad and this is their mom. And that's all I remember. Look at their time machine. I really think you should be wearing your gloves, Ted, said Professor Pablo. I'm like a woolly mammoth. I don't feel the cold, shivered Ted, who hated wearing his gloves. In fact, his fingers were feeling a little chilly now, so he, re so he reluctant reluctantly put them on. The treetop family had been looking for woolly mammoths for three or four days, and they still hadn't found any, but suddenly... All, Alfie, I'm going to say Alfie, but suddenly Alfie, skiing a little in front of the others, spotted a, a large herd of them. <gasps> Yay, they found the woolly mammoths. I think this is Alfie, the one who found the woolly mammoths. Herd. Woolly mammoths! shouted Alfie, pointing ahead. The woolly mammoths were standing still in a wide snow plain just below them. The treetop family skied down and hid behind a large rock so they could observe the creatures without disturbing them. The woolly mammoths were about as big as African elephants, and they really are very hairy. What are they doing with their tusks? asked Tulip. Oh, look, they're hiding. Do you see them? I think these are the baby woolly mammoths. I think woolly mammoths are like a type of elephant. I really have never heard of them before. The mammoths were using their tusks like giant snow plugs. Plugs? I don't know how to say that. To shovel away the snow. How fantastic. How fascinating, I mean, said Professor Pablo. They're getting rid of the snow so they can reach the grass underneath to eat it. They watched as one of the... creatures delicately twisted up the grass she, un she had uncovered and put it in her mouth. There was something unusual about the mammoth's trunk. About a third of the way down, there were two flaps of skin, like a cobra's hood. They look just like mittens, said Tulip. Tulip was just wondering what they were for when the woolly mammoth reached out and inside a snow and made a snowball, then tucked it inside one of the flaps. When she looked, when she took the snowball out again, the so this is what they're doing. Can you see? Snow had turned to water, and she spouted the water into her baby's mouth. All the lakes and ponds have turned to ice, explained Professor Penelope, which is the mom. But this way, mammoths can make water out of snow, and they also use their mittens, mittens 
to keep the tips of their trunks warm when it's freezing cold. Just then, Alfie noticed something moving be from behind a big rock, something that had been lurking watching them all along. It's so cute. What's watching them? What is the something behind a big rock that was lurking watching them? Let's see. Oh, oh, a Sabra toothed cat, shouted Alfie, pointing out of their hiding place and waving their his hands around in excitement. Excitement? Why are you, why are you excited? The Sabra toothed cat started charging. But it wasn't the woolly mammoths it was charging towards. It was the treetop family. Ski down, shouted Professor Penelope. And the treetop family, ski down. Why? Why Why is it aiming for them? What did they do? Pointed their skis down a nearby hillside and flew across the snow, leaving a sabri toothed cat far behind. The creature was very much... Very surprised to see them shooting away so quickly. It had met humans before, but never once on skis. Oh dear, said Alfie in dismay. Now we're at the bottom of the hill and it's going to be a long climb back up again. At least we'll get warm doing all that exercise, said Professor, Professor Pablo. And it was worth it to get a good close look at the woolly mammoth. Nighttime in the cave where the treetop family had made their home. Professor Penelope and Professor Pablo were watching the stars from the cave entrance. Asha and Alfie were reading books by the warmth of the campfire. And Tulip was drawing a picture of the woolly mammoth. What are you doing, Ted? asked Tulip. Ted was seeing if he could turn snowballs into wa drinking water like the woolly mammoth. But all he was doing was making his gloves wet. It takes practice to be a woolly mammoth. You can't learn to do that sort of thing in just one day, which is true. The end. All right, next book, which one should I read? I'm gonna pick this one. Treetop Twins Wilderness Adventures, The Twins Greet a Great Auk, which is kind of like a penguin, I guess. Here we go. The water swished and swirled as winds rippled its surface and creatures moved beneath. The treetop family have turned their time machine into a boat and traveled back in time to the 19th century, to the North Atlantic Ocean, looking for a bird that lived then called a great auk. Look at the little fishies. Bloop, bloop. Let's see. Next page. The treetop family had been looking for nesting grounds all day, and they still hadn't found one. They were tired and hungry, and it was getting late, so they moored their boat by the shore so they could make a camp for the night. Don't worry, I'm sure we'll find an ox, said Tulip. I'm wearing my lucky crystal. That's not very scientific, said Asha. When I was younger and I read this book, I thought the word scientific was specific. That moment, a, a white-tailed eagle came around the headland and flew overhead. It was carrying something in its claws. claws. A ray of sunlight glinted off, off Tulip's crystal, sending out a little beam that confused the eagle. It dropped the thing it was holding into the sea and flew away with an angry screech. Professor Penelope waded towards the object and fished it out with a net. What did it drop? It looks like an egg. Why was it carrying an egg? It was a big white egg with brown markings. This is a great ox egg, said Professor Penel P Pablo excitedly. The eagle must have been hunting in their nesting grounds. So now we know where they are, right around the headland. I told you my lucky crystal would help, said Tulip happily. It was just a coincidence, said Asha. The sun shining on your crystal got into the eagle's eyes. It is kind of a coincidence, but it is also lucky. That's how their egg looks like.
Look at the reefs and fishes and the ocean. The treetop family walked around the headland as they turned the corner. They heard a loud noise. It was thousands and thousands of pairs of gray ox, and each pair was looking after an egg. Wow, said Ted. These gray ox are nearly as big as me. There's so many. Look at all these gray ox. Look, how, look at their little eggs. Look at one of them's laying on their belly. The gray ox were very loud and very clumsy. They had big black beaks and white bellies, and they weren't afraid of the treetop family at all. There are so many birds, said Alfie. How do we find who this egg belongs to? Professor Pablo placed the egg gently on the ground, and the treetop family walked away. And out of the ground, two gray ox came waddling up, squawking fiercely. Oh no, they're mad. I guess because they thought that the treetop family took their egg. But they don't look angry. One of them lay down on the egg. That is amazing, gasped Alfie. How did the parents know it was their egg? It's because of my lucky crystal, said Tulip. Actually, Tulip, even though there are thousands and thousands of eggs, each has each one has slightly different markings, explained Professor Pablo Penelope. So it's possible the great ox recognized their own egg, just as we would recognize you even in a big crowd of human children. You see, Tulip, said Asha, there is always a perfect Millie, a perfect, <laughs> perfect Millie, a perfectly reasonable scientific explanation. Nighttime by the North Atlantic Ocean. The sky was still light as the treetop family had dinner around the campfire. I wish we could see the northern lights, said, said Tulip. What are the northern lights? asked Ted. There are where the sky lights up with, there are where the sky lights up with colored Flashes, often green, pink, or yellow, said Professor Pablo. It's a spectacular sight and something you can only see when you are far very when you are very far north as we are now. Ooh, look at the DNA. And only in winter and early spring too, added Asha. So as it's June, your lucky crystal can't help you, Tulip. But when she went to bed, Tulip put her lucky crystal under her pillow anyway. And now, she, what, and now she was dreaming of the northern lights. What a sight they were. In Tulip's dream, the night sky was alive with the most brilliant light display you could ever think to see. It was the perfect end to a perfect day. Luck may not be very scientific, but sometimes it works. The end. All right, next book. How about we read this one? The Twins Watch a Whale. Here we go. The book is as dark as the ocean. The water swished and swirled as winds, as winds rippled the surface and creatures moved beneath. Hey, that was the same sentence as this book. The treetop family have taken their time machine, not back in time, but up, up into the air above, high above the South Pacific Ocean. Professor Penelope and Professor Pablo were hoping to photograph some of the animals that lived in the ocean from above. They're so cute. I love all creatures, all animals. I love bunnies. I love horses. I love dogs, lions, tigers, all animals, even deers especially baby ones. From the position high up in the sky, the treetop family could see dolphins leaping out of the water, but it wasn't dolphins they were looking for. They were hoping to see something a little bigger. Wow, said Alfie, pointing downwards. Is that? Down below, a most enormous shape had come to the surface of the water. It's a blue whale, said Asha. The professors were so excited. They grabbed their cameras from around their necks and quickly began photographing the big blue whale. Oh my gosh, it's huge. It's like, take up the whole thing. It's huge. 
It's huge, what I just said, said Ted. The wheel was longer than three buses back to back. And look at what's there next to it, said Asha. It was a baby whale, which wasn't small either. The baby whale was about the size of an elephant. So imagine an adult whale and a baby whale. A baby whale is already the size of an elephant, and elephants are huge. So, of course, the adult whales, like the mom whale or the dad whale, will be huge, ginormous, enormous thing. Twinsies. The blue whale is the largest mammal that has ever lived on the earth, said Professor Professor, said Professor Penelope, her eyes shining, and they were very shy and rare. So they so we are incredibly lucky to see them up close like this. Whoosh! A great jet of water and air puffed out of the mother whale's blow holes and shot nearly as high as the treetop family. I can see the blue whale has two blow holes, said Tulip in excitement. Another gigantic blue whale swam up beside the mother. They seemed to be trying to push the baby whale to the surface. I think that's the dad. What are they doing? asked Ted. They're helping the baby take its first, its very first breath, explained Professor Pablo. How very kind of them, said Tulip. Oh, yes. Blue whales are very, are shy, but they are very kind, said Professor Penelope. Not surprisingly, because great big whales have great big hearts. A blue whale's heart is as big as a piano. And I know how a piano looks, because I have one. It's a grand piano, not a keyboard, a grand piano. That's huge. The treetop family took photos of the whales until the sun began to go down, and they decided it was probably time to head back to the shore for dinner. The author and illustrator of these these series are probably like scientists because they know so much information. Also, look, the back has the mom, the dad, little twins, and big twins. Professor Pablo went to went to the controls to turn the time machine around. As he did so, the three whales set sent up three jets of water from their blowholes. They're waving us goodbye, said Tulip, waving back. Goodbye, lovely whales, goodbye. But the time machine didn't seem to be turning around. It seemed to be dipping down towards the sea. What's happening, Ted asked Professor Pablo. Oh, they're trying to help them. I'm afraid we're a bit low on fuel, said Professor Pablo. Oh dear, worried Professor Penelope. Whatever shall we do? As the time machine sank lower and lower, Alfie spotted something. Hey, Tulip, rather than waving at whales, why don't you wave at that boat down there? Instead, said Alfie, pointing at a huge ship, maybe they can give us a lift home. Wow, it's huge. It's not a boat, it's like a cruise. So Tulip and the rest of the treetop family all waved and shouted at the boat below. And eventually, the captain of the ship looked up. He blinked in surprise at the strange sight. But sure enough, he changed his course to pick them up. Professor Pablo went to the controls and made the time machine go down until it was gently resting on the deck of the boat. And the treetop family were brought back to the shore. Nighttime on the shore of the South Pacific Ocean, the Chita family were having dinner around the campfire. Out in the bay, the dolphins were playing games in the light of the moon. Wasn't it kind of the captain, captain of the boat to rescue us, said Penelope? I mean, said Tulip. It was, said Professor Penelope. A human heart may not be as big as a blue whale's heart, but humans can be kind and helpful too. And that's so true, because that's what I am. <laughs> The end. Oh, I got my finger caught. Okay, so next book. Let's read this one. The twins seek a saola. I really don't know how to say it. Saola. Saola? Because it has... spelled like this. I'm just going to say saola. Mm -hmm. The air was hot and full of noises as unseen animals squawked and howled from within the forest. 
the Chi Chow family have taken their time machine not back in time, but deep into the mountains of Vietnam, looking for one of the rarest and shyest animals in the world, the so the the Saola. Ooh, Vietnam. You know, pho, pronounced, I mean spelled P-H-O, is a type of, it's noodles that I love, and it's, it's from Vietnam. It's Vietnamese food. What am I saying? Scientists have only seen saolas in the wild a few times, said Professor Pablo. That We only discovered they existed in 1992. Because they are so hard to find, they are sometimes referred to as the Asian unicorn. Said Professor Penelope. Tulip's eyes lit up. What do they look like? She asked. They look like they they look a little like an antelope. Said Professor Penelope, with two pointed horns in the front of their heads. I hope we find one. Whispered Tulip to herself. After a while, it began to rain. The Treetop family were very tired. They had climbed uphill and they had climbed downhill. Oh no, it's raining. They better not catch a cold. They had splat. Ooh. Look how muddy. They had splashed through stream streams and waded through mud and wriggled through undergrowth. They were all wet and cold and hungry. This is hopeless, said Alfie. I think we should go back to the camp and. Look! said Tula, pointing. I just saw a Saola. Where? asked Professor Pablo, excitedly looking around. That way, said Tula. So the Chicha family trugged after Tula, getting wetter and dirtier and hungrier by the minute. But there were no, but there was no sign of Tulip's Saola. However hard they looked. I think we should go home, Tula, said Professor Penelope gently. Wait, look through there, said Tula, pointing ahead. There it is again. Why doesn't the family see it, but Tulip does? Tulip, said Professor Pablo, frowning. I saw it. Why don't you believe me, said Tulip. Just then, there was a low barking noise. The, the Saola, said Tulip, lifting up her head. There was the noise again. The treetop family followed the sound into a, a clearing just above a riverbed. And there was the Saola. It was a brownie red color with flashes of white on its face with, and two horns jutting out from the top of its head. And it does not look like a unicorn, so I don't know what you're saying. But the Saola was in trouble. It was running away from a great big crocodile that had staggered out of the river, and its hooves had got caught in a vine. Wait, what? Vine? Yeah, vine. Wait, what? Yeah. The, so, the Saola could not get away. The crocodile was approaching, getting nearer and nearer. Closer and closer. Dun, dun, dun. Da, da, dun, dun. Da, da, dun, dun. I'm trying to make this kid friendly. But Professor Penelope wasn't going to find an extremely rare Saola. For the, first, for the very first time, and let it be eaten by a crocodile. She picked up a nearby branch and held it above her head and rushed at the crocodile, roaring loudly. The crocodile was so alarmed that it turned around and ran away to the safety of the riverbed. The rest of the treetop family ran to help the snared Saola. The Saola was trembling, but it... Oh my god, she's so aggressive. The mom... Calmed very quickly, Tulip and Ted stroked its soft neck while Professor Pablo and, and Asha and Alfie worked its hooves free of the vine. For one calm minute, the Saola stood there free, and then it leapt away again, back into the forest as if it had never been there at all. The Trichop family were so happy to have seen a Saola that they cheered. Professor Pablo cleared his throat. <clears throat> Did anyone perhaps take a photograph? Oh dear, they had been so busy saving the Sayola that no one had thought to take a picture. No one will believe us, said Alfie. But we know it's true, said Tulip. Nighttime in the mountain, mountainous forests of Asia. The rain had stopped and the moon was rising on the warm nighttime world. The treetop family were sitting around their campfire having dinner. 
I knew if I stayed hopeful, I'd find a unicorn in the end, said Tulip. And Tulip was right, because even when it looks like a quest might be impossible, if you stay hopeful, all your dreams can come true. Great quote. The end. All right, guys, last book, The Twins Pursue a Penguin. Are you guys ready? Last book. The snow gleamed and dazzled as the sun glinted off the ice. The treetop family have turned their time machine into a snowmobile and they have traveled not back in time, but far, far away it, to Antarctica to study the chin strap penguins. I don't know why you twins have brought the toboggans, said Professor Pablo. Because tobogganing is so much fun, said Ted. And even serious scientific professors like us need to find time for fun, said Professor Penelope. We're too busy to have fun today, said Professor Pablo firmly. I want to film the, shin, the chin strap penguins underwater. In the distance, they could see down the hill to the shore, where the penguins were gathered, and they could hear them shrieking away on the edge of the water. Professor Pablo was hiding, not hiding, heading for the snowmobile when Ted had, it a, had a suggestion. We could toboggan down, he said. I think that's an excellent idea, said Professor Penelope. Then we get to do our work and have fun. Such a great idea. You get to do your work and have fun. So they loaded the equipment out onto the toboggans, pointed them downhill, and whoosh! The Utah family tobogganed down to the shoreline. Woohoo! shouted Professor Pablo as he shot down the hill down by the water. The, tree, the chin... Why am I reading so fast? The chin strap penguins were feeding their baby chicks. They're so sweet, said Tula. The adult penguins looked as if they were wearing little. Oh my God, they're adorable. Oh my God, I want to squeeze their cheeks. Old fashioned motorcycle helmets with straps under their chins and their, che and their chicks were gray and round and fluffy. Why are they always too why are there always two chicks chasing after the bigger penguins? asked Asha. That's because most chinstrap penguin families have twins, exclaimed Professor Penelope. Just like us, said Tula. The penguins were very clumsy on the ice, waddling from side to side or siding on their tummies. And every time a parent chinstrap penguin waddled off and came back with food in its mouth. It's Two babies would run after it, both wanting to get fed first. It looks like if they're playing a game, and said Alfie. We think they have these food races so the penguins can feed the baby separately and make sure each gets the same amount of food, said Professor Pablo. Just then, one of the chin strap strip penguins dived into the water, followed by another. Right, everyone, let's go, said Professor Pablo, and the treetop family got ready to film the penguins underwater. They put on their dry suits, which would keep them warm in the icy water, and waddled uh, uh, around as if they were chin strap. Why do I keep saying strap? It's strip, strip penguins themselves. And then they all dived in and swam after the penguins. Underneath the ice, the chin strip penguins that had been so clumsy on land, on land glided through the water and elegantly and they were quick to more than three minutes faster than the fastest human swimmer the portly little penguins flew underwater and it was the clumsy humans who couldn't keep up it was a magical world under the ice and the treetop family filmed not only penguins but bright orange sponges and octopuses whose blue blood contained a natural antifreeze and seals and arcus and they had filmed and filmed until they got tired and decided it was time for dinner nighttime in antarctica the elephant seals load on the ice flows and wandering albatros flew lazily overheard overhead the treetop twins were warming up around the campfire after their swim under the ice Professor Pablo decided to help warm them up by pretending he was a parent 
chinstrip penguin and they were the baby chicks. He ran away with their supper and they had to run after him to get it back. It definitely made dinner time more interesting. The sun still shone overhead because the, in Antarctica, the, in the summer, the sun never sets. So long after supper, the whole treetop family rode around on their toboggans until it was time for bed. Woohoo! shouted Professor Pablo as he whooshed down the slopes. He had forgotten how much fun tobogganing was, and even serious scientific professors need time to find fun, which is so true. The end. Wow, guys, this is like a 30 minute video, half an hour. Alright, guys, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey, don't end the video yet. Fun fact Do you know that I actually saw deers before? When I was going in a trail with my family, I saw deers before. It was the cutest thing ever. Anyway, so now you know. Fun fact about me. Now you can sign off. Peace.